Okay, it's now noon in Toronto, and I want to welcome you here to this virtual lunch with Frank Anderson. I'm Michael Kerman with Leading Edge Seminars. And um, if you've seen these before, I'm always so happy to see so many familiar faces as well as new faces on the Zoom screen. And what we're finding is that these, this Zoom screen has just been a fantastic way to have interaction and involvement together and feel like we're part of a community, even though I know we have people from Uruguay and California and all over Canada and other places here with us today. So thank you very, very much. Um, so what I'd like to do is first tell you a little bit about some things that are coming up, including a big announcement, which we've just decided to make about something coming up, uh, which I'll tell you about. Um, first, in terms of what's on the leading edge agenda for the next while, uh, in May, we don't have a lot of webinars, but the next one happens to be Frank Anderson's <laughs> foundation course on IFS. And it's the next thing we're going to do outside of a few little minor things going on. And that's going to be May 20th and 27th. And it's really going to be Foundations of IFS with Frank. And then in June, almost the next thing coming up after that is a virtual lunch with none other than Janina Fisher, who is a good friend of Frank's and uh, has been with us many times on the screen. And that will be followed up on June 2nd, 3rd, and 4th with a three-day webinar on uh, transforming a revolutionary trauma treatment with Babette Fish, uh, Babette, not Babette Fisher, Babette Rothschild, who wrote uh, a book on how the body keeps the score in 2000. And she's been a leader in somatic therapy. So she's always interesting. She'll be with us for three days for a 12 hour program. So those are some of the things coming up on the screen. But I want to tell you about something that's coming up in person. If you can believe it, we are not planning anything in person in Toronto. But we had planned, Frank and I had planned something which we were very excited about for this past February. We were going to go to Cancun and do a five-day training where the mornings would be training him bringing along some of his merry band of trainers uh, and then be at a beautiful resort. And we had this all planned for this past February. And of course we didn't do it, we couldn't. So we went ahead and planned a four week program in Cancun for next February. And on one of those weeks, Frank will be there in one room presenting uh, on trauma treatment and IFS. And in the other room next door to him will be Janina Fisher presenting. Now, uh, we don't have all the information available to you yet because we're gonna have a new website devoted to Leading Edge Cancun for February, 2022. And we're gonna announce this to the world in terms of how you can see all the details and information uh, in about a month's time. In early June, we'll send out an email to all of you and let the world know that over four weeks in February, we'll have Frank Janina, we'll have Bessel Vanderkoek, Lisa Ferentz, Terry Real, uh, Roy Keesley and EMDR. Um, it's going to be quite an amazing week, uh, month. And you'll hear about that in a few weeks time. So that's kind of the big announcement. Don't look at our website for information. Don't ask us for information yet because it'll all be there for you in about a month's time. So let's get to today in May 2021 um, and how this is gonna work. So first uh, we do encourage your questions and in order to ask questions to Frank, which will be taken after Frank and I have a little chat together privately among with you thousand people watching. Um, Emily, you may, you may see in our screen is officially our hostess with the mostess. She is there for, for, for you and for Frank. If you have questions you would like to ask Frank, please just put that in the chat box. If you're also having any technical problems or anything, anything else, let Emily know. Um, now, everything we do, including today, is archived, which means we will get a link to this later today. If you want to watch it again or tell a friend, hey, do you want to see this? It's all free. It's all there. You're going to get that later. Um, we're also going to send, because you're watching today and you register, we're going to send a discount code if you decide you want to attend Frank's training as well uh, on May 20th and 27th. So that's the kind of... <laughs> intro portion. So now I'd like to bring Frank to the screen. There he is. And Frank, really nice to see you. Do you want to bring us up to date? I thought we'd start off just like 
a year ago we met at the beginning of this pandemic and it was like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? Can you work online? Just tell us about your life now in the last year and what it's meant to you, what you've learned, what you've seen. Where are things at with you and life? You know, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me. It's, 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 it's always near and dear to my heart. I don't like the cold weather, but I love Toronto and I love Michael and Leading Edge Seminars. So it's always wonderful to be a part of this group. It's such a wonderful, lovely community. So I just wanna say thank you for having me. Um, boy, I don't even recognize myself from a year ago, if you wanna be, if I can be fully honest. Um, prior to a year ago, I was pretty much traveling the globe, speaking all over the world, you know, teaching about IFS, trauma, neuroscience, and boy, what a hard stop, like we all had, right? I just, it shut everything down. And I'm such a super extrovert. I thought this would be hell for me, being locked up and locked down <laughs> for, a certain, turned it out a couple weeks, couple months and then a year and a half, and I have just loved it. I have to say, I have, I have, I, I have identified parts of me that I never knew existed. Um, I've got homebody parts, I've got shy parts, I've got parts of me that love not going anywhere and being at home, and that was a total surprise to me. So I was really, really surprised by that. I've slept better than I've ever slept in my life in this last year. So this hard, this hard stop really was a blessing and a gift for me personally, but also for my family because I have two teenage boys and we've had some of the best times ever within this last month. So I feel a little bit guilty for some of the jewels that I've gained out of this pandemic, because for me, in some ways, it's been lovely. Um, I also have worked really, really hard, almost in some ways, harder than ever. I've written a book, which I'll tell you about, um, finished a book. I've been writing it for about three years. That's super exciting. That's nothing like a pandemic. Everybody was baking breads and cleaning out their closets. I was writing a book. Right? So that was some of what was going on. But I also really transitioned into online teachings. I've been teaching, I'm still teaching all over the place, but through this new Zoom, I've become a Zoom expert. I can tell you in and out of every little nuance of the Zoom technology now. And I've transitioned my whole, you know, work life onto Zoom, like many of us have had. And, you know, working with people in this pandemic has been really stressful. There's been a lot of people having waves and waves of difficulty, cycles and cycles. I mean, cycles of the pandemic kind of would be an article I would write. There's been so many iterations, components and dimensions of this pandemic for so many people. You know, I don't know a therapist who's available and open right now because everybody seems to be full because the mental health need is so enormous. So in, in this very paradoxical way for me, honestly, Michael, there's been this beautiful gift and the luxury of quarantine. And it's been just so awful for so many people and trying to be there for people in the ways that they've needed um, in some of the worst times that we've ever seen. So it's such a, such a paradox is the best way that I'll say it. But I also will say one other thing and then I'll stop. I have this, I'm vaccinated and you know, in the States there's a very robust plan now Many people I know are vaccinated and I'm fearful and hesitant to get out in the world. Like there is that fear factor that I have now around, is it safe when you, when you're living in a world of uh, the, the world is unsafe for over a year, you don't just flip a switch to get back into your life as normal. So I'm aware of a very gradual re-entry process that I'm in the midst of experiencing right now. So that's another one of those dimensions of this that I'm in currently and noticing. So um, that's a bit of what I've been up to and where I'm at at this point. And I know it's going to change. Yeah. Well, we're a little behind you in Canada in terms of vaccine yeah. rollout, but uh, yeah. we're getting closer, which is yeah. which good to say. I couldn't have said that a month or two ago. Yeah. You know, in, in terms of what you're seeing with clients um, and yeah. what you're hearing, you know, we hear a lot of talk about what the pandemic has done and increased in this and that and the other thing, anxiety, suicides, 
self-harm, but specifically, what are the kind of things you're seeing either that you wouldn't have expected or you would have expected? And how do you, what are you seeing now and what do you predict for the future as we come out of this? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I have kind of been taking notes, I have to say, because as someone who's been working in the field of trauma, really my whole career, you know, I was, I was there at September 11th. I was there for the Boston bombings. Like I've, this has just been, I've worked with Bessel van der Kolk forever. So I'm kind of used to trauma. Like that's the world I live in. And there's a, there's, this is like no other in the ways that none of us have ever experienced anything like this. So I've been really kind of tracking this and I do believe I will be writing about this um, as it settles and continues. Um, the thing that I'll say that I noticed surprisingly in the beginning was how much what I will call legacy trauma had come up for my clients. And what I mean by that is this, you know, when we're all forced to be restricted, contained, okay, it activated so much from people's histories. I did so much work on Holocaust family legacy burdens, for example. A lot of people in that containment got really triggered around their family of origin and all the stuff that came up with the Holocaust, okay? People that have been held down in their past, all their past traumas came up. Like the, the, the initial restriction really activated so much in people's histories, in my experience, that was so deeply buried. I, I've been calling that first phase the double trauma era. Okay, there was the trauma of the present, everybody was freaking out. But then so much from people's histories got activated in ways that were buried, they had thought, they had already processed that, another layer of stuff came up over and over and over again. And a lot of family legacy burdens uh, came up, which I saw and was dealing with pretty, very intense work, really quick. That's like the acute trauma phase almost a lot of intense work. And then there was this hopefulness that I saw in the summer when the weather was nice and people, oh my gosh, maybe yes, maybe yes. So then this resurfacing of hope showed up and then it got slammed. It got slammed in the fall when the cases showed up again. And then I saw this just hopelessness settle in in the fall for people. It's like, oh my gosh, I thought no, I can't have this. This isn't for me. We have to stop. And when people got yanked back in, I saw a huge resurgence of hopelessness and depression, especially those folks who are living alone was like, I can, you know, I maybe can sustain this for three or four months. I can't do this for all fall as moving into the winter. So I saw so much. That's where, that's where for me, I saw a lot of fatigue set in, you know, in the beginning, everybody was doing um, uh, cocktail parties on Zoom and meetups on Zoom. Nobody was doing any of that in the fall. They're like, I don't have the energy. I can't do it. It takes too much work. I am burnt out. And then, so I saw that fatigue set in in the fall. And that's where I also saw a lot of substance use Let me turn this off. Um, show up, a lot of activation of substance use during that period. Um, where people were just like, you know, I can only take so much. I've got to look for other ways uh, to manage this because this is too much for me. This is where, you know, wearing even the most resilient of us down, right? And for me personally, and with you guys too, you know, in Canada with these winters, um, it was brutal. I would say that the winter was the worst for people because there was no end in sight it got really bad. And for the people that were living in these Northern hemispheres, you couldn't go out and do anything. So there was this being hauled off and that was really painful from a clinical perspective for me. Um, just really, you know, I, some of my clients who have seen for a long time done really well, just started decompensating and falling apart. One of the things that breaks my heart around this is the adolescent population in particular. Uh, work with a fair amount of um, adolescent folks. And it was such a crisis for this population. And it still is here in the States where there was no beds available in patient units at all. Kids were sitting in ERs 
for weeks at a time waiting for beds. And I've never experienced anything like that in my lifetime, where there was not even bed available for teenagers who were just, you know, belonging and connecting is a whole part of the adolescent experience. And that got totally stripped away from them. Uh, so that was really painful for me too, to just see people at their worst, I would say, um, very resilient, high functioning folks who just couldn't manage the endurance, you know, the sustainability of this pandemic. So for us in the States, as you had mentioned, wow, I think over almost, almost 60% of the population has at least had one shot. People are just like, is it true? Is it true? Can we really, can we really start? I think there's another layer of potential hope, hopefulness showing up right now. And I, I, I suspect and hope that this will be more sustainable. And it's going to take years for us to sort it out and recover from it. Because one of the other things I'll say, boy, I had no idea. I had so much to say about this, honestly, is that it's one thing to help somebody who has a trauma history. After all people, that's why we're therapists. I'm here to help you. But it's just another layer when I'm going through my own while I'm helping you. So we are all traumatized while we're helping our clients who are traumatized. That's going to take a lot of time to sort out and process. What is my trauma as a result of this? How has that affected me? And then how and what do I do to sustain my helping clients? Okay. Most of us are burnt out. Most of us, you know, have done more work than we've ever done. So I think this is, there's, there's a lot left that is going to be happening for all of us, including our clients, around the residual effects of this global pandemic. You know, um, I, one of the things I'm really hoping is, you know, I have this new book coming out, it's Transcending Trauma, funny enough, is the title of the book. Um, and um, I know it's going to cause this huge flurry of activity in my work life, as my first book did. And I'm really hoping I'm going to be able to learn something from what I've just been through. I don't want to go back to the way it was in many ways. I think we were out of control. I think things were too fast paced. I think we were pushing ourselves in ways that was totally unhealthy. So I'm hoping for an integration of what I've learned from that trauma, which is what we want to teach all of our clients. What, what pearls and jewels are you going to take from your adversity and how are you going to incorporate it into your life moving forward? And I hope for that for myself personally, I'm very cautious and careful about what I'm going to take on moving forward, even though parts of me are dying. I love travel. You know, I've, I've committed to Cancun um, and Beijing and Korea next year. I'm like, that's it. <laughs> like, I want to try and do more Zoom things and not travel, over, not go back to that life I lived because it was it was in some ways out of balance. So we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens. I think mind, being mindful is really important of all of our parts, which is what IFS teaches us so well, is to pay attention to all the different parts of ourselves and how we manage and navigate as we move forward. Wow. Well, there's a lot we can pick up on. And I'd let everyone know that we will open for questions shortly. I know a lot of people have joined in the last few minutes. So if you have questions, uh, please go to the chat line and Emily will, will call people to the screen. Uh, yeah, you've talked about your life and, and changes meant that are coming in terms of less travel. And I'm wondering what you think therapist life will be like when clients can come back into the room. How has this all changed the world of therapy and service? Yeah, you know, I think it remains to be seen. You know, I have an office suite with a, a, a group of eight different therapists, you know, here in my local town, and everybody is in varying degrees of sorting out what their life is going to be like. I don't know anybody at this point who is going back to what it was. Every single therapist that I've talked to so far is looking at this hybrid model. 
Okay, everybody I know is like, how much online am I going to continue? Which of my clients does actually online serve? I have a lot of high functioning people who love the ease of not having to drive 45 minutes to my office and they can fit this into their day in a different kind of way. You know, there's a lot of work that's been done on Zoom. We rarely sit and look at somebody like this so intently, like it's exhausting partly because it's so intense. There's no places to look and hide. So there's an intensity that the Zoom can offer some people that can be valuable. Some of my clients have been more revealing because they're in the safety of their own home and they're not with another person. Other people, some of my kind of, I would say my more severely traumatized people, this hasn't been great for them. They have really needed my body physically in the room. Those young attachment wounded parts need something concrete to see and feel and touch. I'm not going to say that I do touch with my clients, but it has been very difficult for some of my DID clients, for example, who really need a person at the other end that this virtual world is messing with them, right? Because they need that concrete presence. So I suspect that many of us will go back in some form. Like I've, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know that I'll ever really go back, honestly, full-time. And I won't go back full-time. I know that. Um, whether I sublease, sublease my office or give it away fully, I'm not quite sure. Um, but I think everybody's give, I think it gives all of us an opportunity to reassess. You know, how much do I have to work? In what ways do I have to work? What ways work for me from a self-care perspective and what works for which clients? Because I think there's a range. I think there's a range. I certainly have had that in my practice. Um, some people have no desire to go back and other people can't wait. So I think it's gonna be a new normal for all of us um, as psychotherapy um, moves forward. You know, um, yeah. That's, that's what I'll say about that. Um, I'll just, just want to pivot to one other issue around psychopharmacology, and then we'll open up for questions. Yeah. I know, you know a number of years ago, you were often asked because you, you are a psychiatrist and an yeah. MD, and a lot of people who aren't able to prescribe had concerns or worries thinking about the role of psychopharmacology and psychotherapy. Yeah. I understand in this Last year, there's been an awful lot of meds being taken. I'm wondering, just talk about your views about this whole issue and, and in terms of, in general, and what COVID has meant for, for this kind of use. In, in, round med, in psychiatric meds in general? Yeah. Oh my gosh, all right. Roll up my sleeves. Do you really want me to get going on this? There's so <laughs> We'll much. give you a few minutes. <laughs> I know. You shut me off, Michael, when I, when I start talking too much. I mean, what I'll say briefly is this is in, in a bizarre way, teletherapy for MDs has become much more prevalent and possible. So they, there's, they're, oh, they're loosening the restrictions so you can prescribe to people in all these areas where they couldn't get access to meds before. So accessibility is much better. And you know, I had to check a box on my, um, my ML practice now, are you doing teletherapy? So they're covering teletherapy, which is great because people who couldn't get access to meds now can. So there's gonna be increased accessibility in a way that's wonderful for people to be able to get meds, okay? So in that way, I think it's good. And I think it's beneficial. Um, there's always been a shortage of psychiatrists. It's always difficult to find somebody. Internists always pitch in. So this might make it easier, especially if psychiatrists can sit at home and prescribe for people. So there might be a benefit to this teletherapy in some ways. It's also, from the pandemic perspective, so many people are reaching for substances of all kinds to get through. So the self-medication, self-medicating has kind of exploded also, <laughs> which I, this is where I don't think it's also great. People are doing a lot, you know, substance use, eating, overeating, substance use, exercise, all these ways of coping is just, they've all exploded in a way that, that I'm really concerned about, you know, especially in the, in the States here with the, and in Canada with the increased use, uh, accessibility to all these psychoactive substances. 
THC, psilocybin, ayahuasca, you know, not ayahuasca yet here. Um, MDMA just got approved, you know, um, psilocybin, the, all of these medicines that can be very effective when used appropriately are also accessible in a way that I think is very dangerous and very harmful. And people are reaching to these psychedelic medicines for self-medication because they're in such distress. So I think we're gonna see this two-tiered system in this way, those of you, the, those people who are using medications in a very wise and responsible way with good intention, and those of us who are gonna be self-medicating without being regulated and monitored in a way that for me personally, I feel is gonna make a bad situation that much worse. So I really am concerned about the accessibility personally and the self-medicating. My father, for Pete's sakes, who has chronic back pain, told me, I went to the dispensary. He's a pharmacist, okay? And he went to the dispensary and this purple haired, tattooed 18 year old gave him a cocktail for his back pain. I'm like, that's a problem. Like that should not be happening, right? And that's what's available. Okay, so there is a way that these medica medications can be used very responsibly and can be very helpful. Some people have gotten very good benefits from THC, for example, or CBD when it's done appropriately. So boy, we're, we're in for a wild ride from my perspective around these medications. That's, that's kind of the way I'm seeing it right now. Okay, well, thank you. Well, I'm sure there are questions, so I'll turn it over to Emily, and I will request, uh, if you could say where you're from, that would be interesting, and then if you could try to keep your question brief, because there are probably a lot of questions, and I know we won't get to them all. So, Emily, what do we have? Okay, um, our first is an email question, um, and if anyone has questions, just let me know in the chat if you'd like to ask it yourself or if you'd prefer me to read it. Um, so, I'm noticed, so this person says, I'm noticing that as I incorporate IFS into my practice, some clients take to it right away and others meet with an, irate, with an irritated response and saying things like, I don't know, I don't feel anything towards it. And quickly, we'll keep talking about the part when yes. I'm looking for the self-energy and asking how they feel towards the part. I'm wondering if you can offer any advice on helping to get clients oriented towards the model and this new way of approaching the issue. I think part of my struggle is that long-term clients are used to being with me in therapy in a different way. So I don't know how to present this new model to them when it's met with some confusion or disinterest in it. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's a great question because there's mul multiple layers around this transition for people to develop a relationship with their parts. Okay, so some, so, and this person who asked the question speaks to a lot of the dimensions of that. So for example, most therapies are talk therapies of sorts. I mean, there's EMDR, there's sensory motor psychotherapy, but most therapists have talking parts of themselves that engage with storytelling parts of the client. Clients are telling us stories, talking about, talking about. From the IFS perspective, that's a part. It's been dominating the therapy session, okay? So this introduction to you have parts, shift your focus inside and start listening to what's going on inside is a whole game changer for many, many clients who have been in traditional talk therapy. Um, the idea I have parts is often much easier to wrap people's head around than the, the ability to shift their focus of attention inside to stop talking to you and for the therapist to stop talking to them and allow somebody to open the doors to listening. So that's a very difficult transition. Okay, it doesn't happen easily. When I do that with my clients in the beginning, say, go inside, they go, hello? Oh my God, you know, I'm like, okay, a second and a half. Let's double it, right? Let's see if you can extend the time inside, which is scary. This is exactly where they're trying to get away from. 
So you as a therapist who's inviting somebody to go to the very places inside that they've spent all of their time and money, if you will, staying away from, this is a big shift. So it doesn't happen quickly and it doesn't happen overnight. Some of those clients, yes, they catch it and they get it. It's a natural fit for them. The other thing I'll say about this, the people that are really resistant, not only is it like danger, Will Robinson, they're scared because we're going to these scary places and they're going to have parts that show up to come up with all reasons why not to do this. The other thing that I find particularly difficult, and this is probably more so for people with trauma histories, is they're blended with their parts. So this idea of separation, being with instead of in their parts is not easy. The more and more I sit with people, the more and more I'm aware that the ability to to separate from parts is so challenging. People aren't aware that they're living most of their life in their parts. Now they may be high functioning parts, I am John. I am Susie. What are you talking about? This is where you're going to get a lot of that resistance. I don't have a part. I'm not a part. It's me, you know, but it's, it's them in the part that really has been running their life for decades. You know, Janina Fisher, who talks about the structural dissociation model, calls that the ANP, the adult normal personality. That's not self energy from the self from IFS's perspective, that's a high functioning part. So to get people to separate from that part, super challenging, super challenging. And what new therapists tend to do is just work with those self-like parts as we call them, as if they're the self. And then they start moving through the models and pushing way too quickly. And it doesn't work. And they get frustrated and then they throw IFS away. This idea of taking the time and helping clients really unblend or separate is an enormous challenge for many, many people. Okay. And one of the things that's also, or another thing I should say that's very challenging for therapists is if you don't know what self-energy feels like within you, it's much harder for you to help your clients separate from those parts that say, I am me. It is me. What are you talking about? Yeah, I feel compassionate. Yeah, I'm open. You know, it's, it's set in a quality that's not authentic. And if you don't know what it feels like, you're going to get fooled that, oh, that's the self that IFS is talking about. Why isn't this damn model working for me or this client? It's really not working because it's not self-energy. It's a high functioning manager part of them that has no real interest in separating because this part says I'm running the show. If I separate, everything's going to fall apart. So they're not interested, you know, and I'll say it can take months you know, for these parts, and it can take years sometimes for clients with DID, for these parts to be willing to separate from that self. And that is a big challenge. Um, You know, one of the things I'm I'm now actually going to start the Institute, just start teaching some level one trainings, because as many of you may know, it's like next to impossible to get into a level one training in the IFS Institute, because the demand is so enormous. One of the things, one of of my first kind of out of the gate teaching tools is the self to part relationship. That is not easy. Okay, that can take a very long time. So any resistance, Emily, that this person's talking about, I can't, what do you mean? I don't. That says there's no access to self energy. Those are all parts and they're blocking and they don't like the self, they don't want to get to know the self because self abandoned them and that's a resistance. And so to stay there and be clear that that's where you are, 
in the long run will really help because it's super challenging and people march right through without really getting it. So that's a great question. And there's a whole thing around that. So I'm glad somebody asked that. That's, that's really important. Thank you. Our next question is from Joanne. Hi, Joanne. Hello. So thank you for um, being here. Um, I did the training with you in clinical applications last year around this time. Yeah. And um, there was something I didn't ask then. And when I was rewatching the videos, it, 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 I had the same reaction as when I was watching you live. There was a couple of times during the training when you would say things like, I guarantee you, or I promise, or if it, if it promises. And I don't know if it's a Canadian thing, but I don't, like, I'm from Ottawa, Canada. Um, I feel really hesitant to use such strong language. Yes. And I wanted to ask you about that because, yeah, it did. Uh, it, it, it activated. It activated you. It yeah. parts, right? Yeah, because well, I don't. I, I don't like to make a guarantee on something that I can't guarantee, and I don't think I can guarantee. Well, you can't. <laughs> And I can. I'm oh, sorry. No, that is that is that is right. That so I'm glad you got activated on that, right? And and I don't. I also don't like to say always and never. Like that's a thing yeah. that I'm not a big thing. Like when I was writing this book, right? I'm like scratching out all the always and never because you you know it's like no 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 no. There's always exceptions to those rules. I will say, and this really does come with your own confidence level, okay? On what you can authentically promise, okay? Mm -hmm. And what you cannot authentically promise. And it has to be genuine. Dick Schwartz used to say, or he still does say this, borrow my confidence. You know, if you don't yeah. have the confidence, I'm like, ah, that doesn't work for me. I don't, I think maybe it's confidence, but I think it's also, I really think it's a cultural thing. Like it's, I think a big difference between Americans and Canadians, like we don't, I don't, well, I don't know what other people think, but I, I, we just don't really talk like that so much here. Um, well, here's the thing I will say, though. I can say, I can promise you we can heal this wound. And I will say that because I have a level of confidence, depending on the client. I don't say that to all of my clients. Okay. okay? I don't, you know, or, um, you know, some of those absolutes, when I have a level of confidence... When in me and in their ability and the belief in this model, I mean, I really believe this model. Okay. I have, my life has changed because of this model. Yes. Okay. I don't walk around with PTSD anymore because of this model. I am so different. I have a, a, a belief in my souls, in my bones that this is possible. Okay. So I will say that when I feel it. Okay. If I don't feel it, I won't say it. Okay. I really don't. I don't say like with some, with a lot of my DID clients, even though I know it's possible, it's so much harder. It takes much longer. And, you know, but there is that hope. Well, you know, maybe Joanne, you use the words that you feel comfortable with, but you are injecting hope to a hopeless system. Okay. And that, if the, that makes more sense, I just don't like to use that word like guarantee or yeah, yeah. then don't, oh, the, oh, the guarantee, the overwhelm, right? That's another one. That's where that comes up. And I, we say this a lot. So, and this would be, um, well, I do say that I'll say, I, you know, what if we, here's what I would say. What if we can guarantee that that little girl will not overwhelm? Right. That's a thing yeah, we'll say. Yeah. Right. Right. I still, and, I still, like, yeah, that's I'm right. And, and I'll talk to that little girl until I feel confident that she's not, she is willing and she promises not to overwhelm. And there ends up being a lot of trust in those relationships. When she says, I promise I won't overwhelm. And I say, Hey, we've got this guarantee from her. This ends up being not only trust within me, but trust within the system. And if that little girl does overwhelm, then we have something to go back on. Wow. Tell me more about this. You promised you did, wouldn't, and you did. Tell me more about that. What happened there? Okay. So really in relational trauma, it's a violation of trust. 
It's a violation of a relationship. So we're working on repairing, right? These violated, these relationships that have been violated internally. And if the word promise or guarantee doesn't work for you, don't use it because it's not authentic for you. And you really shouldn't use it, you know? But, but how do you convey hope to yeah. hopelessness? Yeah, I think that I think I could do in an authentic way, but you got it. those words, the, yeah. That yeah, and good. that matters. So you've got parts up around those words, then you shouldn't you be using those. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Our next question is from Jacqueline. Hi, Jacqueline. Did you want to unmute? Hi, um, Frank. First of all, I want to say to you that I think my dad, who's 87, may have met your dad. At the <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> uh, so he's in the Berkshires and he has back problems that stem from his escape from Germany during the Holocaust. Yes. He is going from doctor to doctor yes. and medicating with yes. anything they will throw at him. Yes. Yes. And so, um, and even though the doctor sent him to the dispensary, the doctor knows nothing right. Right. about how to prescribe cancer. So it's left back to the gal with the purple hair. Yeah. So I wanted to know what you have seen in terms of pain syndromes over this last year as part of kind of the complexity. Well, it's interesting. You mean as it relates to the pandemic? The pandemic and people's legacy traumas. Yeah. Well, is that, you know, I said, as I said earlier, so much legacy has been coming up. Like it's been coming up layers and layers and layers. I've just seen so much of that. The pain thing, I'm going to, Jacqueline, I'm going to talk more general than just pain because I've seen so much stuff show up physically for people. Like it's the channel, it's the conduit, it's the communication of parts. There's no outlet, right? When you're contained and you're not seeing anybody, you're, there's not much to, dis, to um, project onto. There's not much to throw out towards when you're stuck at home. And so I have seen, that's another thing that I've seen is a lot of physical symptoms showing up, right? And in, in the IFS, not only pain, but a lot of other medical conditions showing up. And people can't go see their doctors, so they're doing these televisits. So it, it causes this urgency and stuckness for a lot of people. I mean, certainly now people are able to go see doctors again, uh, more so here too. But it is the communication of parts. We're always seeing any physical symptom as a communication in parts. Okay, so I'm working a lot in the body a lot more in the body. You know, we just, it's so interesting because we just, I just released this course called The Integrated Therapist on Pessy.com, integrating all models of therapy. Janina Fisher was able to, I interviewed Janina around the somatic piece. So we did somatic um, <clears throat> treatment around that. And very much so am I seeing more, I'm doing more and more of the somatic work lately because things are being held in the body things are being expressed in the body and people are not aware of it and working with it at that level. So I think it's really important, you know, perfect opportunity for your dad, separate from mine, right? He, he's got his own uh, legacy around his physical symptoms for sure. Um, but you know, what's, what's manifesting in your body and what is it, how is it related? Like that kind of curiosity, because the often in my experience, Parts show up somatically when there is a lack of any conscious awareness. It's mostly an unconscious communication, right? So how do you bring it conscious? That's what we found in our rheumatoid arthritis study. Those were all caretaking parts that seized up people's joints. Okay, so without any conscious awareness. So when, you're, when physical symptoms show up, it is an unconscious communication from a part. Okay, it's not conscious. So it will take a while for people to make those connections. Oh, my asthma is related to my inability to speak up. 
you know, oh, my back pain is related to the burden that I'm carrying around, you know, the war that I was in that I never really processed. Like that's not an easy connection for people because it comes in these very unconscious somatic representations and it takes time, you know, I hope that's helpful. Yes, very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Our next question comes from Ken. Ken, hi. Hi, thank you. Michael. Hello. Michael, first, thank you on behalf of most of us, I believe, for reducing this professional isolation. Yes. It's ever so important, and thank you very much. Frank, congratulations on your book. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious if the next level of IFS training will be facilitating the use of MDMA with IFS. And with that, I wonder, it's ever so important to respect protectors, the resistance. Yes. So if MDMA is going to facilitate the moving away of protectors, what happens with that respect for the protectors? That's a great, great question, Ken. And yeah, um, so boy, that's, I, I, so that's the next course I'm creating. I'm filming this one over the summer, which is IFS and psychedelics. Dick Schwartz is very interested in incorporating IFS as a, as a psychotherapy integration for all psychedelic medicine. Most likely I will be creating a level two training in the IFS community on IFS incorporating with psychedelics. So absolutely, it's a big, big topic. Uh, Bessel um, has a, a conference in a couple of weeks um, with a panel of a bunch of people integrating psychedelic medicine. As many of you have known, just I think yesterday or the day before yesterday, it got, it, it got approved in the phase three trials, MDMA did specifically, which means expanded access is now available. I'm one of the sites supposedly, so I'm gonna be doing my MDMA training. I've already done my ketamine training, so I'm ketamine trained. It's a very, I'm passionate about this world of psychedelics, not in the way that most people are. I'll tell you that, okay? I do believe there's enormous potential for huge progress for our very sick, chronically traumatized population of patients. These people who cannot access self-energy, these people who have had such a hard time healing. These people who are chronically reaching for substances in a way to numb out. So I think there's enormous potential and I'm cautious and guarded because there is a momentum that is this be all end all. This is gonna fix and cure and solve everything. And I don't believe that is true. I think we're gonna be very specific about who benefits from this kind of medication. I think each one of these psychedelics does different things physiologically and they are not to be treated equally. MDMA does something very different than ketamine, does something very different than psilocybin or THC. So there is this specificity that we don't have yet in this field that we will gain over clinical experience over time. Okay, so I think there's so much in this world, a lot of excitement because it's really positive and potential is great and a lot of caution because of what we don't know. Okay, the other thing I'll say, Ken, specifically to what you're mentioning around protector permission. Okay, this is one of the big deals, one of the big reasons why I do want to create uh, an IFS curriculum for psychedelic medicine integration is because horrible backlash can happen when all parts are not on board, okay? And I don't think it's standard practice in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy to get everybody's permission in order to do this work yet. I don't think that's standard practice. Those people who know IFS will incorporate that. Those people who don't will not. And a a dear friend of mine, Libby Call, Elizabeth Call, who's very involved in the psychedelics community, and she's been doing a lot of this work, says there's a lot of backlash for people when they don't get permission. Okay, some people have really bad trips because there was not protector permission granted, and there's huge backlash. Okay, I have one client who's been 
dis chronically dissociated for about 10 years because he did underground MDMA and they gave him pulse doses way beyond the standard, whatever it was in the underground world. And he, so much stuff shot up for him. His dissociative protector has shut him down so powerfully, okay, for a very long time. So I really think we have to pay attention to that. And I'm hoping we're going to be able to create some protocols around this amazingly wonderful field in a way that's done safely, particularly as it relates to trauma. You know, they're using it for substance use, for death and dying. There's all these different applications of psychedelic medicine. I'm looking particularly as it relates to trauma. Thank you. Yeah, you're and welcome. I, wanna say, I just wanna say one more thing. Sure. I'm with you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, are there times when self-medicating with THC is okay? <laughs> I have clients who've exhausted all medical doctors and tests and they still have pain. Is this around cr pain, chronic pain? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, I would wonder about, well, so I would wonder who's making the decision to take the THC. That's the way I would look at it inside, right? Is it a self-led decision? Are parts making the decision? I'm not going to say it's wrong to use THC because I don't necessarily believe that. But one of the things, for those of you who know this, and I used to do a lot more of these workshops than I do now, is working with the integration of medicines um, and psychotherapy. And what I would do from the IFS perspective is every part needs to agree before any medication is taken. Well, most prescribers don't do that at all. They're like, what's your symptoms? Here's your pills. See you in three weeks. Thanks for the 15 minutes. Like that's the reality, unfortunately, of psychiatric care because of the way insurance companies and health systems organize things. So I do it differently. I really take the time to have every part weigh in on the pros and cons of taking any substance into their body. And everybody needs to agree in order for a prescription to be given. I would, Emily, in response to this person's question, I would have the same exact policy as it relates to THC. Is everybody in here okay with it? Does anybody have any concerns? We want to make sure everybody's involved, everybody's on board before we try this. Okay. Is self involved? What part is wanting this? For what reason? So I think there's a way to look at that. And, you know, who was it? I forget the, um, was it Joanna, um, who, so Jocelyn or somebody said, never, always, the always and never, right? When there's a person who says all medical things haven't worked and this is the only option, I get cured. That's a part response. That's not self-energy. So I would listen to that part that says nothing else works. This is the only option. It might be. But all parts need to agree. Self needs to be involved in the decision. And then trying something is a, different, is a whole different relationship or experience. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Katerina. Katerina, are you there? Yes, hello, hello. Hi. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hello. Uh, thank you for the knowledge. Thank you for the wisdom. Uh, may I ask you something about uh, phobias, extreme fears. Uh, can this be a chance, this lockdown be a chance to face, uh, to overcome the denial, to face some difficult situations, to overcome fears uh, through medication maybe or through some, all this staying at home all the time who can face uh, phobias and uh, this denial can effectively, what do you think? What is your opinion? Yeah, so you bring up an important, couple important points, Katerina. One is um, when we're working on any symptom, whether it's chronic pain, whether it's a phobia, whether it's depression, we're looking at what percentage is emotional or psychological or part related, and then what percentage is medical or biological. So we're always teasing out those percentages. Usually it's a combination of both, something biological that might need medicines, 
and something emotional that needs to be processed and sorted through. With phobias in particular, um, we don't do um, any um, forcing people to overcome or facing their fears. IFS does not work that way. Or denial, for example. We don't use those terms and those words. We're looking at the positive intention of the phobia. Okay. Because in my experience, and I'll tell you, um, I'll think of his name in a minute. Michael Elkin is one of our lead trainers, has a whole phobia protocol. And Michael talks about the symptom of phobia and the wound that's underneath it, because there's, you can always trace it back to an event. There is a traumatic event. I'm afraid of spiders. I can't cross, I can't cross a bridge. I can't go in an elevator. We look at that phobia as a protector of something that did happen. And we will track back to the original event and heal that wound because there is a wound there. Every phobia that I'm aware of is rooted in something real or gets attached and connected because of circumstance. So we see it as real. And we're looking at the ways the phobia, the part that holds the fear is trying to protect. So whatever that it is will never happen again. Okay. So we don't push people beyond their comfort level. We want to make sure every part is in agreement around going over that bridge, but let's go over the bridge after we heal the wound that was terrifying was traumatizing when you did go over that bridge when you were three or four years old. Most phobias, are the, the underlying event is unconscious. And it takes clients a while to get to the actual event because it becomes unconscious. It's so terrifying, it gets repressed. But I trust it's there and we can get there and heal that so that we can allow you to walk over the bridge or go into that elevator without that underlying terror anymore. So it's a different approach, but we do work with phobias in that way. Thank you. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I know we have a lot of questions. We're gonna to have to close and I wish we had more time, but I know we don't. Uh, I just wanna say a few things in closing. First, uh, thank you, Ken, for your comment. And we've also been area, interested in this area of psychedelic assisted therapy and what it means. Um, we had a series and Dick Schwartz will be with us with Ron Siegel in the fall, as will other people. And then also another announcement, which has not, not been announced yet, but next March in February, Dick and Bessel van der Kolk and Gabor Mate will be part of a conference that we're helping to organize around psychedelic assisted work and some of the issues related to that, bringing a lot of interesting people together uh, in San Diego next year. Um, if you missed the early announcements, uh, Frank is back with us May 20th and 27th for eight hours foundations in IFS. And we're offering a discount to the people who attend this virtual lunch, as well as a discount to join Babette Rothschild on another tr trauma treatment from a somatic therapy approach early in June. And Janine Fisher will be with us on June the 1st for a free virtual lunch. She'll also be with us in Cancun the same week as Frank is there. So you'll be hearing a lot more about that. We always close this way. We give Frank the second to last opportunity. And then we open up all the microphones and with a number of people, a cacophony of thank yous and goodbye. So thank you very much for being here. Frank, over to you and then to everyone else. Privacy standards. And it's fully encrypted, oh, so you don't have to worry about Okay, well, I just, you know, thank you all for being here. Um, it's an exciting and, time um, for all of us because of where we're heading and these new opportunities. And I hope we all take advantage of them in ways that make question, sense for all of us. Remember, we use our, EMP, whoop, I'm uh, I, I don't know who's unmuted. Who's uh, muted? Okay. Okay. Oh, there we go. Um, and I do want us to take advantage of these opportunities, because this is a huge opportunity for all of us to learn and grow personally, as well as to help our clients learn and grow in new and wonderful ways. So um, thank you all and let us all move forward in the ways to make this world a better place, in all the ways that we thank can you. personally and for other people. Thank so thank you very much thank for joining you.